that it has less impact. Uh, that's not true. The short stories can have big impacts that can help kids to start taking those first steps towards a, a, a better knowledge about Jesus and then moving towards that action and relationship and those discipleship things that we want. Um, I'm going to tell you also, and I'm going to try to not trip over these things, I am a pacer, and I talk with my hands, which is why I'm very grateful that they did not give me a hand mic, because it would have hit you. Um, <laughs> once when I was working here, I was the assistant director here for a few years, um, there was a song that requires me to go like this a lot, and there is a pond up at the upper um, uh, at a campfire bowl, and I made it almost all the way to the water from the stage with that microphone just hurtling off. It did. It is in service to this day, I believe. So... Um, and again, these short worships are super impactful. Short stories can have major impacts on how we think and how we uh, continue to talk about them. For instance, um, I'm going to give you just a couple of things that are going to help you think about how stories can help you think about things long term. Um, there was a, a young deer. His mother passes away. He is raised in a different set of circumstances. What is this story? Bambi. Yeah, right? Okay. Um, there was a man. He had two sons. Sounding a little familiar? Not yet. Okay. One son tells his father that he wants his share of the inheritance. Yeah. That story is about this long. You remember it 2,000 years after it was told. Jesus uses this method. He doesn't view himself as being too good for it. And so uh, I like to think that, you know, if it's not too good for Jesus, it's probably not too good for me. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit about three practical ways that we can start improving the way we talk. Um, first, actually, let's talk about what is the point of a worship talk. Well, it is to reveal and educate and inspire young people. And show what are we revealing and inspiring them towards? Jesus. We want to show them a clearer picture of who Jesus Christ is. Um, and again, worship talks are not the most important thing you do. The most important thing you do when you're working with young people is you are spending time and building relationships with, with them, letting them know that you care. Yes? Are we going to be using the slide? Uh, can we turn on the lights? Yes, we can turn on the lights. No worries. Yes, I will not be using slides. Um, mainly because they asked me on Wednesday and I didn't have much time. <laughs> so, um, the first thing that is going to be very helpful to you is telling stories. Lots of stories. Stories are like what gets the kids listening. They yes. Want Stories are very helpful. They, and again, uh, it was said this morning, children love stories. Everybody loves a good story. I do. Almost every time I have a conversation with somebody, especially in pastoral uh, responsibilities, I often interject stories because that is kind of who I am. I just love telling stories. Um, so to give you an example of this, and then we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, I took a vacation recently. And by that, I mean maybe a year ago. Um, I, don't, I don't take vacations very much. They make me nervous. Other places. What do I need? New places, I tell my wife. Well, if they were so great, where have they been all this time? Uh, so, and, and you know, when I, was, when I was younger, I was working here at summer camp throughout the summer. So there was not much of a vacation time there. We went off to uh, Hawaii. It was a real trial. Um, you know, sunny, very relaxing. Uh, this was in early March, which in Spokane is sort of like... Uh, yeah, it's like you have experienced something good for a while, and then life slaps you in the face, and it snows again. Um, <laughs> so we're there, and I'm in the water, and I love uh, snorkeling. 
it is a very relaxing thing for me, and I don't get to do it much in Spokane. Uh, as any of you who have driven through Spokane know that there is not a large body of water nearby. And Maui is sort of shaped in such a way that it has a series of other islands right next to it, and it creates this little bowl in the ocean. So in comparison to other spots in the ocean, it is relatively shallow. Now, because of this, humpback whales come into this area to have their babies. They do this because it's safe there, because uh, predators generally do not come into this shallower area, and humpback whales emit a sound. I will not be replicating it for you. <laughs> Uh, they do this by using a certain, uh, what's called a resonance chamber, I believe. It's in the back of their, what is essentially their throat. And if you're wondering, where's the throat of a whale? Find a marine biologist. I'm a religious studies major. <laughs> so, and, and that resonance helps them create that long wailing sound that you hear. And it can be heard, scientists say, at certain conditions up to 10,000 miles away by other whales. They're singing, and it is actually a proper song. It uses phrases that change and adapt over time and generations. New whales come in and improvise upon the song, so there is a chorus and a verse and a chorus and a verse. Um, and what is remarkable about these whales is that they are so loud that if your head is underwater during a certain time of year, you can hear them just with your ears. You don't need any special equipment or anything. You can hear the song all around you. And I had been snorkeling a few days, and uh, you know, I don't, I'm gonna show you, like, see, I, like I'm very pale. And I seared like an ahi tuna. Like, burnt to a crisp. And uh, so I decided to lay off, you know, exposing my pale body to the universe. Uh, and we went on a whale watching tour. And that is where I learned that you could hear them as long as your head was underwater from these people who were experts in whale behavior and songs and things. And I was thinking, no way. I've been swimming before out here. My head was underwater. And I couldn't hear a thing. I was, uh, I was aware of my, you know, breathing, and I was aware periodically of my wife nearby, and um, I, I just could not hear it. So I decided I was going to experiment with this. We were going to go swimming again, my wife and I. We went back into the water that afternoon after having lunch, after waiting, you know, the requisite amount of time to avoid cramping. And we're in the water, and my wife starts tapping me furiously in the water. This is not a, like a thing I really enjoyed feeling at first because I'm like, ah, oh, great, there's a shark or something. We're going to die here. What a vacation. <laughs> Should have stayed in Spokane. <laughs> and I look at her as quickly as my head could move, and she's pointing at her ear. And I'm like, what are you, what is, what is this motion? What is this? She's wanting me to listen. And my ears start tuning in to the song I hear everywhere. In the most mundane parts of the ocean where there was nothing but sand, all of a sudden, the whole place came alive because I could hear it. You could hear different whales singing as though they were in the next room. Loud and clear, I pulled out my GoPro camera and I recorded the songs. You could hear it, beautiful, wonderful songs all around me. But all it took was for me to stop hearing it. All it took was for me to start getting distracted. 
is that I'd start looking at this sort of fish, or I'd think about that, or my wife, I was, I was brought up in Florida, so you know, I, I know about riptides and different things that the ocean can do, so I'm keeping aware, but my wife is a missionary kid from Albania, where, you know, they don't swim or anything there, so I'm always like keeping an eye on her, because I, you know, you know, my wife is the one that takes care of everything in the house, so if she was to get swept out to sea, I would be uh, devastated in multiple ways. <laughs> Um, and that's, but all I wanted after I could hear this song everywhere was just to experience it more and more. And when I would come up out of the water, I'd stick my head up and I would be expecting to hear all these other people around me th saying how cool it was that they could hear these gigantic whales singing all around them that you could see periodically them exploding out of the water. No one else could hear it. They just couldn't. They just hadn't tuned their ear in to this wonderful song that was all around them. And all I wanted was just tell somebody, grab them by the shoulders, like, don't you hear it? Don't you hear how beautiful this is? How it could change the whole way you look at your world right now? This is how I view God. That there is a God who is pouring love out across all the people I encounter each and every day. And all it takes is for me to tune in and remember that my God loves me. That I am passionately and wildly loved by Jesus. And that he loves all you people in this room. And that person who cut me off this morning on the way here that is passionately loved by Jesus. And that all it takes for me to, for, to stop hearing it, to stop being aware of the love of Jesus poured out across this world, is for me to get just a little bit distracted. Just distracted enough for me to start thinking about me. For me to start thinking about how these people make me feel bad. Or how I would like this person to be punished in this way. Or I think, you know, these myriad of distractions that we experience. When it's still there. It didn't go anywhere. The love of Christ is here among us now. Jesus, God, living inside of us. When we allow him to. All it takes is for us to tune him out. And it can be so easy, can't it? Okay, so first we started talking about whales, right? And you were wondering, where are we going with this? Correct? Because whales, while they are created by our marvelous and wonderful God, are not immediately relevant to scripture, except for maybe Jonah. What I did was we were creating tension there. So your brain was starting to work out, okay, we're talking about whales, and I kind of was buying you into this, helping to paint with words, right? And then we shifted, I used certain key words, the whole place became alive. Just as when we tune ourselves into the love of Jesus, that all of a sudden, our world can become alive. It helps us to change the way we look at our world, right? Those are parallels that we're drawing. So with the story, we are helping the audience to start working their brain in the way we want them to. Now this is not because we're trying to like hypnotize them, though, you know, working with some Pathfinder clubs, it might be nice <laughs> from time to time. If you could. No, we are, we are simply trying to set an emotional stage, right? So that you can then slip into the more important thing. The whale, glorious animal, but is far less important and valuable to our everyday life than me recognizing that, wow, Jesus really loves me. In fact, he loves everybody. And that when I allow that to come inside of me, when I open up my heart, and my ears and my eyes to that, it can change the way I view the people around me. So, I'm going to take a second look at my notes. Okay. Um, 
So what are some of the benefits of stories? Well, one is that stories can help you retain attention for longer periods of time. I have had kids, I don't know, how long was I talking on the bus? Sometimes an hour. I could tell them a story for like an hour. And they were with me. I could see them engaging and looking at me, with me. And young people, uh, probably, I would say, it, it starts to shift up around uh, 13 or so. But young people show that they are listening in different ways than you and I show it. So most of the time, the way we show as adults that we are listening is that we are, you know, looking at the person. We're sometimes giving that agreeable nod that some of you are giving, and I really appreciate that. That's, that's like candy for a pastor to see that nod. Thank you. Um, that nod is sometimes all you need to get you through 25 minutes. Um, but for young people, sometimes what they are doing when they are, are wanting to show you that they are paying attention is they will start asking questions of it. So that's why it's important to keep flexibility. Sometimes I tell them, hang on one second. I'll take questions in a minute. But sometimes you'll see a kid in the middle of the story. They're like about to explode. You see the hand is shaken. Like the pressure has built up inside of their bodies. <laughs> that like they heard what you said. And they were, now they want to comment on it. That is what, how some of the ways young people show that they are paying attention. They also give the lean. Right? You know when you've got them, right? You see them leaning in, and they've got that crazed look in their eye like your dog when you show them a piece of meat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're looking for. So um, that, it helps us retain attention for longer periods of time. Um, the other is that it can help to uh, internalize and um, and sort of demystify some more complex topics. So, for instance, uh, loneliness is an abstract topic, correct? But I want to express to you what it is like to feel lonely. So, I may use a story or a situation, we call this um, process uh, free association, where we use an example or an abstract topic and we couple it with a story that is sometimes unrelated, but ultimately helps you to uh, couple them together. So for instance, I want you to know how it feels to be lonely. Have you ever been in a bathroom trying to wash your hands with those automatic hand washers and everybody else's is working, but you're the one dummy who can't figure it out? <laughs> And you're waving at it like you're, you're, you're sending expletives out at this thing in the American Sign Language, trying to like get the birds and seeing if you can, and you're, you get more vigorous, and then you watch as these other people, they're coming in and out, no problem. They're able to put their hand under there. They've washed their hands. Six people and, a, and you know, an elderly man have now come in and washed their hands all around you, and you can't get it to work. And then sometimes, you know, you, you shift over to the one next to you because you're like, ah, oh, that one worked for the last guy. And now it doesn't work either. <laughs> everybody else, it was working for everybody else, but you, it wasn't working for. Now have I expressed to you a feeling of loneliness, albeit in a, in a humorous situation, right? You get the idea a little better. So we're taking the abstract or the, uh, or the very complex and we are now funneling it into a situation or story that helps it to be more easily understood. Um, it, can, um, it can also be advantageous to you to, uh, if you have a longer story, break it up into pieces and tell it as a series. Mm -hmm. My favorite thing to do to my Pathfinders and when I preach here at summer camp is to leave what we call, what is it, what do I do? Do you remember? 
Yes, I leave a cliffhanger <laughs> because now I have them. Yeah. And, they can, and when I come back the next day, I can ask them, okay, where was I? And they will tell me exactly what had happened in the last situation and what the moral that we were talking about yesterday was. One of my favorites, and I'm going to give it to you, um, is a author by the name of Lawrence Anthony. Look him up. He is called the, or he, he passed away, I believe, a few years back. He called The Elephant Whisperer is his best book. Um, and it is about how he found, there was this herd of, of elephants that was going to be shot and killed if he did not take them into his private game preserve. And so he saves them from death, bringing them in, even though they are troublesome, problematic animals, and he brings them into his, into his game preserve. And it is, about, it is essentially a story about how he enters into the life of these elephants and works with them, helping them to not be problem elephants, but now to be good elephants. Okay? Now, that sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? That uh, Christ, seeing you and I in a sin-filled state, sees that death is the other option and chooses to rescue us. And then we can talk about the process by which Jesus works with people in their lives through the context of the story of these elephants. So when you have a long story or a book, read it through and break it up into its pieces. You don't have to tell the whole thing. You can tell the important parts. Um, break it apart into those pieces and see if there is a spiritual lesson that you can attach to each section of that. And then see if the kids can name the previous ones. I've seen it work very well. I've had kids who can name me every single thing for like an eight, I think, you know, eight weeks on the bus to Oshkosh. We were talking for two weeks. They could tell me the lesson of the previous series we had done and all of the lessons we had learned about how Jesus works with us. So uh, this is also beneficial because we, uh, we now have time that you didn't have before. So if you read the book and you broke it apart into its, com into its individual, let's say you have five things, you now have five weeks of worship talks done. So you don't have to think about, you don't have to spend your time thinking about what is the topic I'm going to do this week. Now you can spend your time thinking about how can I express this story in, in a creative and, and, and uh, beautiful way to these young people. So you can work less on spending time figuring out, okay, I'm going to use this story and I'm going to talk about this lesson, which sometimes can take us several days out of our week. And if you, like for us, it's Wednesday is when our Wednesday evening is when Pathfinders meets. I, I don't have a tremendous amount of time, but uh, when I have this topic already filled out, I have a little outline. Now I can spend those three days or four days or five days, however much time you have, practicing the story. Uh, series, I cannot express to you enough how much a series can do for you. Do a series if you get a chance. Uh, and leave a cliffhanger at the end. It does not have to be at an important part. I have left cliffhangers where the man reached up and I said, we'll talk about it tomorrow. He was going to grab a can of peas. But they were waiting for those peas for 24 hours, and they would bug me all day. Hey, what's he going to, what's he reaching for? What's he going to grab? Or they would tell me, they would be guessing with me. Because now they have bought into the story. They're engaged with it. They're telling, they're, they want to know what's going to happen. Um, so, um, where do you find stories? Uh, part of it is going to be the, uh, part of it is challenging at first because you are practicing what we call active listening. You are going to be actively listening 
to your world, your circumstances, your life, the things you read, and thinking about how can this thing that I read that was interesting to me, how can I use that to better serve the kingdom of God? Because we are now in the, in the, in the responsibility of we are going to take any story we hear, we are, going to make it ca- we are going to take it captive and we are going to make it submissive to Jesus and use it for his ends. Lawrence Anthony is not a Christian. But I use his stories to express morals and lessons that help young people to better understand their place in this world and their, that they are loved by Jesus and that they can now see those different steps that can help them move forward into a better, freer life. So the series also helps you because now you can take huge ideas and you can break them up into smaller pieces. I own llamas. You can laugh. It's okay. I own three llamas and I am unashamed. How did I get them? That's not what we're here for. In order for them to learn behaviors or tricks or whatever I want them to learn, I break it up into the smallest possible piece so that eventually they can learn it. That's helpful with younger people. And, the, and these series can help you break up big spiritual ideas into smaller bite-sized pieces that help them to digest over weeks or days or whatever you want. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Personal, uh, your personal life is a phenomenal place to look for stories. Do you have a humorous story? Do you have something that uh, grabs you or are particularly about your, uh, your journey with Christ? I'm going to tell you something. I was debating on whether or not I should. Um, if you feel like you have a story that is you and Jesus that is boring, uh, it's nonsense. Or in the original Greek, <laughs> this is why your story is never boring because the king of the universe the creator of all things the one who can accomplish any and all actions intersected with your life as an individual he met you where you were even though you struggle with sins, and they may not be the, you know, I was killing people the other day, Jesus met me, and now I don't kill people anymore. Bad example, but still. Uh, not that you should have lots of murderers talking to your kids. Uh, but you can have subtle, small stories about how your life is being changed by Jesus and how he is leading you forward. And that your story may not be the road to Emmaus, or, or Damascus, sorry. Oy. Long day. <laughs> the road to Damascus kind of thing. You know, the beam of light comes down and Paul is, or Saul's turned to Paul. He may not be like that. But a tremendous amount of your kids may not experience that kind of story either. So it helps them to see these positive Christian mentors, you, um, have a story similar to theirs. Helps to validate their story with Jesus. And it helps them to be more open and honest because you have been open and honest with them. Uh, third thing, YouTube. There is a particular channel known as the Dodo. D-O-D-O. That's the only spelling I will be doing today. Um, it is largely about animals. There is a lot of stories about animals being rescued from bad situations and things like that. These are great fodder for finding stories. Um, what if you find a good story, but you cannot immediately think of a, a moral that fits with it or a spiritual idea or, or this theological thing? That's okay. Uh, when I was taking... Uh, homiletics at Walla Walla University. That is the fancy word for the gentle art of the sermon. <laughs> homiletics. That's your word of the day. And uh, what they encouraged us to do was get a notebook or a file 
or open one up on your computer or your, or your uh, phone. Your phones, most of them should have a little notepad thing in there. Um, find the story. If it was interesting to you, fascinating, it was funny, it, it said something that, that made you feel something, write it down. Write down the source so you know where it is and, and maybe a little reason why you think it's good and then save it for later. Because you may come to a point, and you will, when you are hitting a dead spot in your, I don't have any ideas, I don't have anything left to say, I don't have any stories I can think of, I've, I've dried up all the ones I usually tell, um, then you can open up that file and start reading through. And then you should have, you could have 15 stories there. And then you could be, oh, well, this story would work perfectly with what we've been talking about. Uh, that is a great habit. Some of the best preachers I know, they do this. They have a file. My, one of my professors, Dave Thomas, has a literal file this thick of articles and clippings from newspapers and uh, uh, just all sorts of things in there of varying sizes. And he says once a month, he goes through these and starts reading them. So that is a good place to start gaining stories. Uh, books, again, be a good reader. Um, podcasts, even. If you're not a, a voracious turn the page kind of reader. Audible is a great resource. The audio books, that's how I do it for the most part. I can, I can get through books a lot more rapidly than if I was reading them. So, um, the next thing, let's talk about these things. All right. Um, Uh, put a little bit of this on your hand. I'll get to you in a moment. Okay. We're talking about props now. This is the second thing. So first thing, stories. Second thing, props. Uh, props are helpful in a myriad of ways. I also put games in this section. But we'll talk about that in a moment. So props... When these things were sitting up here, did they catch your eye for a moment? Why does he own a hair dryer? Because I am married. <laughs> does this look like I put a lot of work into it? I do not. <laughs> so, immediately, I got your brains thinking about some of these things. And in your worship, you could line up some stuff right in front of them. And immediately, their brains are going to start working on some stuff. Um, we'll talk about the honey in a second. Oh, no, we'll talk about the honey now. Okay. I've done this. I've done this particular thing twice. I've done it in Pathfinders, and I have done it in my sermon. And my people remember it. Rupert, do you remember? <laughs> He remembers. And it was, I don't know, five months ago. So, uh, in ancient Israel, around the time Jesus walked the earth, when you were a child, you would have gone to, uh, to school. They have a very uh, advanced, actually, at times, uh, way of doing education. So, during the time period, when you were about six years old, till you were about... 10 years old, I believe, uh, you would have been memorizing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And by the time you were 12 years old, your rabbi could look at you, say, what's this word here? Or in this, he would give you a geographic point, so to speak, in a text, and you, as a 12-year-old, would be able to say it. At the more advanced levels, they say that the, the advanced Talmudim, these were disciples who had spent all their lives studying the Bible, they said they could pass a needle through the Torah and tell you every word it hit. So, uh, the first day of school, you're six years old, you walk into school, and the first thing your rabbi does is 
take your slate and your hands and he would take a jar of honey and he would pour it onto that. Your hands, your slate, mind you, you're six years old. Anyone seen a six-year-old handle sticky substance as well? Who knows? What prompted these people to do this? I'll tell you what prompted them. This was a hands-on illustration. After he placed it onto their hands, he asked them to lick it off. Generally off of your slate. You do what you need to do. But <laughs> um, to lick it off, you would taste it. Now, mind you, this is a time when sugar was not a readily available treat. Honey was about it. It was the most exotic, delicious, flavorful thing you probably ever tasted in your entire life. And as a six-year-old, anyone seen a six-year-old say uh, to another piece, like, uh, if you gave them a piece of candy, uh, where they say, like, oh, no, I, I'm good. I don't, I don't need any more. No! We have a two-year-old who stays with us. And uh, her name is Ophelia. She is never content with one piece of candy. The bucket will do. She told me the other day, I think it was, you know, last night or something, I gave her a piece of candy that she had gotten from one of the church things at a harvest festival or something. And I said, uh, here you go. And she said, no, just the bucket, thank you. <laughs> it's like, where do you get the audacity? <laughs> no, I said, you'll get this. And I walked away before getting drawn into a debate with somebody who could potentially be my equal. Uh, <laughs> no, because when you tasted that sweetness, you were six years old, it was probably the first time you ever tasted anything so delicious and wonderful, and you wanted more. Your rabbi would then say, let it be so with, your, with the word of God. Let the word of God may be like honey on your tongue. May it be the most wonderful, exotic, flavorful, and wonderful thing that you've ever tasted. And may you want more of it. How many of you got where I was going before I gave them the moral? A couple of you? Good. Because that's what we were doing. You started to get the idea before we got there. And I'm okay with that because that was my intent. I started giving you little buzzwords, and if you didn't get there, it's okay. You're not, like, there's nothing wrong with you, because you got there at the end with everybody else anyway. We all, have, we all got to the same place, and people remember these tactile experiences. Um, another one. Elliot, can I plug this in somewhere? Thank you. Okay. Um, would somebody be willing to be a, a victim for a moment? It's not going to hurt. You want to go again? Oh, you. Okay, that's good. Okay, I don't know how these things are used, so. All right. Uh, by the way, all the things I'm going to show you here, I've done with children in, Sab in Pathfinders. So it's completely safe. No children have ever been maimed at the Spokane Valley Adventist Church. So I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. So here's the question. Was the wind acting upon her in some way? Yes, yes right? Uh, did you see the air moving at her? Do you see the wind, specifically the wind? No. Did you see it? See no, you did not. So how can you say that it was... You can sit down, thank you. Yes. Uh, how can you say then that it was acting on her? Okay, you saw it. You saw how the wind acted upon this person. Uh, what is the wind uh, compared to in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. Ah, the Holy Spirit that we cannot see where it comes from or where it goes, and yet when the Spirit of God is active in a person's life, can you see how it is affecting them? Yes. Oh, yes. 
And now you have an opportunity to make the kids laugh. Never miss that opportunity. I, first of all, I feel uncomfortable if somebody doesn't laugh at some point, and I will not feel uncomfortable. So, um, there are times, though, when we need that more serious element. But when you get them laughing, I had a girl, she was sitting there, and I actually blindfolded her first. And, you know, she was having a good time. The other kids were laughing. Don't pick the kid who is very anxious to do this, because it won't serve them well. Um, but the kids remember this. I did that two years ago, something like that, and they still remember it. They remember the times that Pastor Michael poured honey on the hands of a couple kids. Be sure you lay down a tarp first. They remember these things. And there is good biblical precedent for this. The prophets were doing stuff like this all the time. Jeremiah busts into rooms wearing a yoke of an oxen on him. You think people weren't talking about that later? Ezekiel. He cooked with an unconventional substance. <laughs> We're not going to get into it. You have a Bible. You think people weren't talking about these things? They used these props, these physical manifestations of things, to express their points in a better way. And that people were talking about it later. And that the more they talk about it, they hopefully are also not just linking it to the fact that Pastor Michael poured some, ha poured some honey on some kids, is that they also are linking it to that, the, the lesson, which is that the Word of God is sweet and wonderful. So, uh, I'm going to race through to the last thing. Um, where do you find these things? That, these are some of the harder ones to think about. Um, I'm going to say more when you use it. Um, when your words just are not quite enough. And especially when you don't have a story. Um, when you need to get a little more extra attention. Maybe they've been having some trouble paying attention. You pour honey on a couple kids, you'll get their attention. Um... <laughs> Let's see. Uh, when you want to get them involved, maybe have every single kid put a little dollop of honey on their fingers. They're all now involved. And you may have some kids who are more kinesthetic learners or, or have these other styles of learning. And usually there is actually a tremendous amount of overlap in the different, in the different learning styles. Um, but some of them may grasp it better. You're looking for every single tool you can that is going to be made submissive to Jesus, that is going to help these kids to have a greater experience with Jesus. That we are going to now uh, take every tool we have, if it's a, a honey bear, if it's a, a blow dryer, if it's, I, I don't know. But we're looking for everything we can. Um, you know a magic trick? Find a way to convert it. Magic tricks have a good, uh, are usually really good with, uh, with Christian things because, or illusions, or whatever you want to call them that makes, uh, whatever verbiage works well for you. Um, because they're usually about destruction of something and restoration. Right? Sin destroys. Jesus, what? Restores. There is a wonderful trick on how you can make kids believe that they, that you have crushed a uh, can, uh, like a regular soda can, and you could, you can have them watch before their eyes, it will, re it will go, it will reinflate, the lid will come back on, I'll show you if you want. Um, but that's a different story. Look up some magic tricks, if you want to just Google, magic tricks for the worships, wonderful. Um, if there is a game that works well with these things, fantastic. You're getting the kids involved. And the more that they are involved, the less likely that they are going to uh, turn on you, so to speak. Because <laughs> you want to see kids have their hands on it. Because lecture is probably the, uh, the weakest form of conveying information for, for tweens which is the majority of uh, Pathfinders. But you get their hands on it. Anyone been to Israel, perhaps? 
Okay? Uh, I know some people who that's one of their things is that they went to the, the valley where David and Goliath fought and they picked up some rocks and they took them home. The kids, th they could tell the stories. And this works even for adventurers, is that you tell the kids the story and then you ask them, would you like to touch the rocks from the valley? And they can touch them. These rocks that were sitting there, in theory, right next to the one that took, it, took Goliath right in the head. So... Um, look for the tactile. Um, okay, three. This is, and I wish I had a little more time, but that's okay. This one is super important. Not that they all aren't. The third thing. So, first, use stories. Second, use props. Third, use them. You have a group of kids there. They are a captive audience of sorts. That's a joke I always avoided using when I was working in the prison ministries. <laughs> so, so um, use them. First off, finish your story. If you have one that perhaps has those, those lead-in questions and you've seeded the story with little hints here and there about where you were going, ask them hey, what do you think that this story, uh, how do you think this story uh, translates into our, into our walk with Jesus? So I haven't said, what do you think this story is about? I haven't left it that open, but I've left it just enough open that they could perhaps have the, the answer I was looking for. Or, and this happens more often than I'd like to admit, they have a better moral of the, to the story than I had, and I was planning it. And sometimes when I hear that, they don't know this, but between you and me, you're not going to tell them. Uh, I just go with, that's exactly right. What a great answer. And if it isn't the answer you're looking for, say that anyway. Say, that's a really great answer. Anyone else? And you can expound on those other ones. Because uh, uh, this is just a thing I think we deal with right now, that young people have, you may have some that have insecurities about being wrong about stuff. Uh, and that's, you know, as we build trust by spending time with young people, it helps to break down those barriers where they feel fear about things like that. But, uh, you know, it can really be damaging to them if, they, if you're like, what do you think this has to do with that? And they say, well, it's this and this. And like, no, that's horrible. That's wrong. Like, and then you just move right past them. <laughs> like, we've just left that kid feeling like he's a dummy in front of his friends. <laughs> that's not the goal. The, and this is a really, really good one. Uh, we do an Ask Anything series. Here's where this comes in. I get a bowl and many pieces of paper, usually two per kid. And I tell them, all right, throughout the next, I have 30 kids, so I could do it for an entire, se an entire session if I want to. That's assuming that each of them uh, doesn't, or each of them answers a, or each of them asks a unique question. Um, and I say this week, or this, throughout this, uh, this next chunk of time, we're going to be talking about the topics you want to talk about. So I say, write down a question you have on anything. It can be a question, and I, I narrow it down a little bit after I say anything, which always gets one kid who's like, but you said anything. And I'm like, that's enough, Chris. And <laughs> he's always got something. And so... Uh, I say like about faith, life, relationships, um, these sorts of things. Give them, give them some topic ideas and then let them write. They, they have burning questions that are going on inside their heads. And let's say you got 10 kids in your club. You have 10 weeks, in theory, of worships. You can take one worship each week to answer the question, talk about it, and move on. Um, we also do this on camp out sometimes. We will do a, a bucket, and this sometimes, this one's a little scarier. Um, 
but we'll take them right out right then. They can be, and they're totally anonymous. So that way, if somebody has that fear of like, well, I, I, how old is God? I get that one a lot. Um, if they feel like, hey, this question might be stupid or something, I was like, I don't, you know, I never treat any of them like they're stupid. We just, they write it down. I don't know whose it is. They put it in there, and I can take it right out. And I've gotten questions like, yeah, how old is God? How, what, how, what's it like to have, you know, what, what was there before God started creating things? But I've also gotten questions like, um, why does my dad hit my mom? Or why do people get divorced? How do I be a good Christian when sometimes I do stuff that isn't good? These are some of the things that are going on inside the life of your kids. And sometimes when you get some of those more serious ones, you may want to do a little sleuthing because it's important that those kids are safe. Um, but also, you are now opening up to them and saying, the things that are going on in your life, in your individual lives, are important. And that it's not just going to be about us picking whatever topic we want to talk about. We are going to talk about the things you want to talk about. And this is, I cannot express how important this is, and this works on almost any age range. We did this as a sermon series, my head pastor and I. I had, you know, 80-some-year-olds asking complex questions that were, that were well worth it. When I was in college uh, at Walla Walla University, it was the first place I saw this happening. And college students, oddly enough, don't come to church very much. When this series came up, they came in droves. They usually, we usually sit in the balcony. That is our domain. It is a drafty domain, but it is ours nonetheless. And, well, it was ours. I no longer fit in there. But uh, it was full of college students who just wanted to know, like, hey, he's talking about the stuff that we asked him to talk about these big topics that we have. Um, and that one, when you, uh, when you do it in the way that you are doing one question a week, it gives you lots of time to, to look into the question and think about it, pray over it. Um, so those are the three things. One, one thing I would hazard, or I would caution you against, is do not, turn worships into a lecture time. And by that, I mean do not turn worship time into a time to correct bad behavior. You do that twice, you lose them. And you have to work really, really hard to get them back. Because what they're starting to think is like, well, here's another time. Pastor Michael's going to chew us out. Like, it, it doesn't help them. This, by the way, if you're ever preaching in front of uh, older people, they don't care for it either. Um, it's much better to correct those bad behaviors one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or, one -on or whatever the, the problem happens to be uh, because that builds relationship and the other uh, drives it apart. So the three things, again, stories, super helpful. Helps retain attention, helps you keep people with you, and it can help you break down those more abstract concepts and holds them together. Um, and again, where can you find them? Anywhere. Does the, Christ, does the author have to be Christian? It helps, but they don't have to be. And here's my reasoning usually. It's like, well, God created them. God made them with these unique skills and talents that, that brought their, their story to life for me. And uh, all things that are good belong to Jesus anyway. So I will claim it and use it to further his kingdom. Um, the second, props. Just keeps, it just makes learning more hands-on. And again, that, that fits in with games. Anything that brings the tactile experience in. And it could be, uh, we're going to touch this thing, or we're going to smell something, or, uh, you know, those disgusting um, jelly beans, those are very useful. Um, magic tricks, whatever you want in there. You can, you're bringing in a prop, a tactile experience to the thing, and it, they definitely uh, remember it long term. Um, and then finally, use them, because your goal is ultimately to reach them where it hurts, 
What are the needs that they are experiencing? And part of that comes when we are spending time with them. We get to know their interests. I'm almost always telling a story that involves an animal because the kids in my group, they really like the animal stories. And so do I. Um, it, by the by, with the story thing, one thing I want to interject really quick, and we're going over, but that's okay, um, is if it bores you, it's not a good story. If you don't like to tell it, if you're not excited about it, it's not a good one for you. But if it excites you, my wife has heard about elephants far more than she cares to. <laughs> because I'm excited about some of these stories and they're cool and I'm like, hey, do you know about this? Those things. But that um, really ask them. Say, hey, we want, we want you to pick our series. Or ask them, pick a book of the Bible. We're going to talk about that. Or, uh, or just get right down to it and say, hey, ask me two questions about God, about faith, about what it's like to be a Christian, about church, about anything in that vein. And do it for maybe two weeks or so so that they get their chance to think about it and write it down. And then go through genu with genuineness, caution, where it needs to be. Um, and I just have to say this. This is the last thing I'm going to say, hopefully. Um, thank you all so much. I don't know if you hear this a lot from your pastor, but as a pastor who has a very large group of Pathfinders, I am so grateful to all of you for how you spend time working with kids we are in an era where lots of people do not want to work with the age range you work with. And I am just want to commend you all for that. So thank you very much. Um, uh, that's, that's all I have. Uh, I want to just close out with prayer and then I'm going to set you free to do whatever it is that comes next. So uh, Jesus, thank you so much for, for this good group of people. I ask that you help us to, uh, to uh, think creatively, to start building up a, a reservoir of things that we, that we think can assist these young people, these beautiful young people, in their knowledge of you. And uh, God just bless us all. Amen.